so this is lecture 36 okay and uh, so the last thing we saw was a uh, couple of ideas uh, hopefully you remember the fractionally spaced equalizers and pass band equalizers uh, okay so those while being similar in uh, in the ideal case while being similar to what's being achieved uh, similar to the previous constraints that the previous structures that we saw like symbol rate equalization and even baseband equalization in practice there might be a lot of advantages to these two things because of various other reasons okay so these two things are used uh, in, in several systems okay so now uh, I'm going to briefly talk about uh, a complete PAM receiver okay so one version of a complete PAM receiver remember when I say uh, receivers have if, if you if you actually see implementations of receivers there are all various choices that you can make for different components and all possibilities exist so what I'm going to draw is one version of it which is which one can say is a little bit canonical as in many many things you'll find similar structures repeated okay so so let me see I mean it's a bit of a complicated picture so I'll try to recreate it as clearly as possible okay so you have input coming in which is uh, a band pass signal right so maybe I'll call it R of T or something okay so the first thing that's typically done is a usually a band pass filter okay so you have a certain band in which you're expecting a signal and since other bands might carry all kinds of other signals you don't want to pick up any of those things so first thing that's typically always done is a bandpass filter in the range of interest okay so after that what do you do after bandpass filtering you'll have to do the phase splitting and then move it to the baseband multiply by e power minus j so the phase splitting is basically just removing all the negative frequencies and keeping only the positive frequency it's a phase filter right so you have to do one uh, crazy filtering so that filter sometimes it's done in discrete time also Okay, so if, depending on the frequencies of your system, depending on what's possible and not possible, you might be able to even do that in discrete time. Okay, so in general, the bandpass filter might have a sampling following it. Okay, so this sampling some will have to be maybe at a very high frequency if you want to do it properly, but maybe there are cases where you can play around with the sampling also. Okay, so in general, there might be sampling here. Okay, but that's optional. Okay, so I'll put a little bit of a dotted line around this. So if you want to do the phase splitting in digital, then you'll have to do a sampling. Okay, so but sometimes it's done in analog itself. So you have a phase splitter. Okay, so after that you have complex signals, right? So till you have up to the phase splitter, the signal is real, obviously, and after that you have complex signals. What do we mean by complex signals? You have to pull two wires out. Okay, so two wires matter to you, not just one wire. Right? It's two two signals matter to you after that. Okay, so the first thing you do is multiply this by e power minus j two pi f c t. Okay, so that's the first thing you do. So you move it to baseband. Okay. Then after that, you're going to start your filtering. Okay, so you have to do match filtering, right, in your baseband equivalent, followed by symbol rate sampling ideally if you want to do that then followed by the whitener I mean precursor then a post cursor okay so I'll assume an MMSE DFE like structure so you have a precursor and a post cursor okay so of course you can do Viterbi or something more complicated but in general that's not very practical if you have a lot, lot of taps that's not very practical so I'll assume an MMSE DFE type equalizer okay and then typically one can also do it in the fractionally sampled domain so twice the symbol rate sampling you might want to do so here you have a sampler which is I'll say KTS KT by 2 okay so twice the symbol rate you're sampling out of the uh, from the signal okay and then this goes to the fractionally spaced equalizer remember the FSC is supposed to do both match filtering and the whitening so it's one filter and that's always nice to design right so you have to adapt or do anything it's just one filter yeah, the taps are adapted in one way there is no no further confusion after the fractionally spaced equalizer you move to symbol rate okay you sample at single rate okay so remember i'm going to do so well so first thing i, sh I should be careful about is this fc 
okay so i may not have fc exactly at the receiver so i'll say nominally i have f1t okay and whatever delta ft that comes in i'm going to take care of inside the equalizer in the passband equalizer so i'm going to do both fsc as well as passband equalizers okay so i have to multiply here by some carrier right okay and remember that delta f if you know it you can use it but delta f has to be derived from the decision so i'll, I'll not show you where it comes from i'll show that later okay similarly these sampling instances this one this one and this one all have to come from some recovery something something further down in the circuit okay so we'll eventually we'll connect it up but for now assume it's available okay so you multiply by a e power minus j delta ft okay then after that you have the addition from the post cursor okay this goes to the slicer this is your slicer okay so the slicer output on the one hand is your decision right this is your uh, s hat k okay but the output is also used for several things okay so one of the first things that that is used for is it's used to compute the error for updating your equalizer okay so i'm going to try and draw this as cleanly as possible but it's a bit of a difficult picture to draw okay so the error slicer error is used first of all to update your your uh, equalizer but it has to be again rotated for the delta f right in the passband equalizer case the error once again is rotated before it can be given okay so to the precursor okay of course the post cursor works with whatever error is already there okay so remember that so what is the post cursor works so goes to the post cursor as it is okay for adapting the post cursor the post cursor also works with the output of the slicer and gets it back into these guys is it okay so make sure the picture is clear in your mind here i have a multiplication from the carrier then after that goes to the fractionally spaced equalizer for update okay so 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 what okay now the input and output of the slicer should also be available to two blocks two blocks that i'm going to call the first one as the carrier recovery block sits here okay and then you have a timing recovery block which sits here okay so okay so let me see i think the carrier recovery block has moved a little bit right oops okay that's better okay so so the input and output of the slicer are going to go to the it's not enough room is there okay anyway so let me see let me take it a little bit twisted sorry about that to the timing recovery block and to the 
and to the carrier recovery block. Okay, so the, there might be other parts of your circuitry which are also connected to the carrier recovery and timing recovery which I'm not going to show. If I start showing all of that, then it will go for a major toss. Okay. So I'll just say the slicer input and output are connected to the timing recovery, carrier recovery. I think it's, it's pretty much enough, but in some cases you might want in some special way other things to connect also. It might connect. You can use something else if you want for carrier recovery, something else if you want for timing recovery. In this case, I'm going to only do timing recovery and carrier recovery based on decisions around the slicer. So that's why I'm showing only those two inputs. You might want other inputs also, and if you want, you can take that. Okay, but I'm not showing all that here. Okay, so the carrier recovery gives you the carrier that you need to multiply here. And the same guy is taken out here and multiplied with this. Oops. Okay, so maybe I'll move this and draw it later. Okay, so that's the one loop and the timing recovery, like I said, it produces three different timing pulses. And they are used for the various samplings in your circuit. Okay, so, so like I said, the, the receiver involves a lot of messy calculations and uh, to faithfully represent that this diagram is also equally messy. Okay, so there's, there's a version of this picture in, uh, well there's an exact same picture in Barry's book, okay, in John Barry's book. So you're welcome to look at it if you want a better idea. Okay, so so, so what? Okay, so the various various things to note. First of all, the first thing to note is that there are a lot of loops. Okay, so previously we never showed any loops in the receiver. Okay, but you see there are a lot of loops. One of the first loops is, and all of the loops involve the slicer input and output. The first loop is the equalizer update loop. Okay, so there is a loop that way. Okay, and the other loop is the timing recovery loop. This is very critical. It goes through a lot of things. The next loop is the carrier recovery loop. Okay. So there are three different loops and all of them have to function properly within specified parameters to for the whole receiver to work. If any of them fails, the whole thing will go for a toss. Okay. So that's where the the, the artistic input in the receiver comes in. Okay. So how do you adjust all these loops carefully? How do you pick the parameters? What do you pick for each of these things? Because what goes inside carrier and timing recovery is usually something non-linear, something heuristic. So usually there will be these PLLs and all these things in order. Okay. So once you have face lock loops and all that, things get a little bit dicey. So how you design them, how nicely you do them is important. But all of that can be done even digital. You don't have to worry about analog PLLs. But still, there are a lot of uh, careful things that need to be done. Okay. So one thing I want to point out is, the if you look at the carrier recovery loop, right? Okay. So if you look at the carrier recovery loop, okay, the output of the slicer goes output and input of the slicer go to the carrier recovery loop then it comes in feeds as a multiplication okay and then it goes back to the slicer okay so in the carrier recovery loop there is no filtering okay of course you can say there's the post cursor but the post cursor doesn't play any role in the carrier I mean doesn't play a significant role at least in the carrier recovery loop okay so within the loop there is no filtering okay so that happened because why did that happen that happened because the way we Way, way we are doing the multiplication, we were able to pull it out nicely. Okay, so the other structure helped you in doing that. If you were to do the multiplication on the inside around the slicer, all kinds of crazy multiplications will happen, and then maybe the post cursor will also play a role. Okay, so right now the post cursor is not playing a role because the multiplication happens in a outside of it completely. Okay, so it turns out that's nice for carrier recovery. Right, so you don't want when you have loops like that, you don't want to put filters and play around with the carrier in any other way. Okay, so, so subtle things like that become crucial in a receiver design. You don't want to put too many things in your loops. How do you reduce it, etc., etc. Okay, so all those things, I won't go into any more detail because 
uh, not much time on this course but uh, but we will see a few things few of these blocks closely and look at some maybe alternative ways of uh, implementing them and make some comments okay any questions just by looking at this picture yes it could have so in this version i'm just doing purely decision directed career recovery okay so so remember see one after the fsc everything is symbol rate okay symbol rate twice symbol rate okay well fsc works at twice symbol rate everything is symbol rate so when it's when i say something is multiplying the carrier don't imagine it is some sine wave or something which is multiplying it's only a complex number every symbol gets multiplied by a complex number okay so it's just one rotation e power minus j delta f kt you're trying to estimate that but it's only one complex number on the unit circle okay so how you estimate that is can change symbol to symbol and you can completely control that with decision directed itself for instance if slicer input if you notice it's at some point is at some point right the previous slicer input would have been at some other point the slicer output would have been something so based on that you figure out approximately where the rotation is then make do that some some such thing i'm talking about when i draw something like this but you could for instance take in the uh the band pass signal okay from the band pass signal you might be able to recover the carrier there are ways of doing that okay so if you do that then it's a different kind of carrier recovery problem okay so maybe we'll talk about that later okay, so right now i'm just doing purely decision directed carrier recovery and decision directed timing recovery nothing nothing more than that okay so the pros cursor and the fsc are adapted according to the lms algorithm if there is a training phase then you will have another block which holds the training data symbols which will be used for the error computation for the adaptation period and then you have decision directed period when the actual out slicer output is used okay so in the training phase you can even for the carrier recovery timing recovery you can use the training symbols which you know exactly you don't have to use the slicer output you can get get confused with them anything else any other question no fine okay all right so so let me make a few more comments now so okay so what i'm going to try to do is to draw the spectrum and maybe even the signal only the spectrum i think only the spectrum at uh, at different points as we go along in this receiver okay so when you're actually building this stuff that's what will help you okay so when you're trying to debug when something is not working all the theory you learned won't really help you, you have to look at actually the signal that you see before the band pass filter after the band pass filter after before before the phase split after the phase split do you do you see what you expect to see okay so you should know what to expect first and then you should know how to see it okay if you do know both then you can quickly debug what's wrong in your receiver otherwise you can never do it okay you'll only keep staring at the final data and say i'm having 50% error rate 75% error rate some crazy numbers like that does the 75% bit error rate make sense Oh, right so just flip everything you will get only a 25% error rate okay so 50% error rate 50% error rate is the only thing you can start you have to know what to expect at each point in your receiver and actually see it see it in a real system or simulate it in a matlab based system and then see what what you expect and then debug what's going wrong okay so maybe we'll see that more elaborately later but for now i just want to show the spectrum at various points and make a few comments about alternative ways of smartly implementing these things okay so the first thing is that the input okay before the band pass filter what is the spectrum like okay so it's very easy to see that so you have a center frequency and the spectrum will be something around that okay so it need not be symmetric about fc right so that's your spectrum at the input okay so so now of course there are two choices like i said you can sample at nyquist rate this whole thing and then run a digital phase splitter if you want okay or you can do analog phase splitting so you you do a phase splitting after the phase splitter what will be the spectrum so only the positive part right the negative part is gone you only have the positive part okay and then you do a multiplication by e power minus j 2 pi f1 kt okay in the digital case and in the analog case it is 2 pi ft f1 t okay so usually so let's assume it's digital or analog one of those things and then you multiply okay but the fc and f1 need not be exact okay so maybe this is f1 this is fc 
Okay, so there will be a small offset between the two of them. Okay, and uh, so you might want to multiply. Okay, so you do a preliminary demodulation, and you get your thing down to this is F1, and now there will be a bit of a weird uh, thing about that. Okay, so this is what you get after a multiplication by e power minus j 2 pi F1 t. You can call this the preliminary demodulation. Where does the rest of the demodulation happen? Inside your equalizer. Okay, so you're doing pass band equalizer. So inside the equalizer, you're doing the rest of the, the demodulation in a decision directed way. Okay, so that's the way of thinking about it. Okay, so there's another way of getting from here to here without doing multiplication by e power minus j 2 pi f1 t. Can anybody suggest smart way of getting there? Have you come, come, come across this something called band pass sampling? Have you heard about it? Okay. So suppose you pick a, f a sampling frequency which divides F1. Okay. Suppose you pick a sampling frequency which divides F1. Okay. And it is such that okay, some Fs I pick so that uh, this is. Okay. So I'm getting totally confused here. So let me just erase that and draw it properly. Okay, I'll write the F1 and Fc on top. Fc, F1, I pick a sampling frequency such that F1 by Fs is a integer. Okay, so it divides F1 and then it is long enough so that Fs by 2 is going to include my entire band of interest. So now if I sample at Fs, what will happen? The aliasing will automatically bring it to base band and then I do a low pass filter to get rid of whatever else that might have been picked up. Okay, so it's a very simple way of making sure you get get this signal down to baseband and instead, instead of multiplying by e power minus j. So this is a common trick. It's very nicely done. But and if your f and if your f c is not an integral multiple of f s or something, you'll always get a delta f. Okay, you might be able to avoid the delta f by carefully designing it. Even otherwise, you can do it. Okay. So all this aliasing is quite fancy, but what's actually happening here? You have a baseband signal. It get, gets multi. You, you're imagining that it's multiplied by 2 pi f1 t and you are putting t equals what n by fs and f1 by fs is an integer. So what happens to the e power term? It completely drops out. It only becomes 1. Okay. So basically the envelope of the complex baseband signal is going to be the, the no, complex passband signal is going to be a baseband signal and there are points in that complex passband signal where your baseband signal gets exactly reproduce. So you simply sample there and you get your baseband signal. Okay, so there's no problem there. Okay, and it's, it's enough if you sample at the baseband frequency. Okay, so that's the idea here. So that's one more way of getting to doing the preliminary demodulation. Okay, so you pick your a clever sampling frequency so that you get, you, sh you need a little bit of a gap also because after that you want to filter it down in case something alias filters in. Okay, so you want to filter it down and you want a gap. So, so you have to pick the FS smartly so that it works out. Okay, and it's possible. Since these numbers are always there, it's possible. Okay, so that's one more way of doing it. It's a smart way of doing things. It happens. So now you have complex baseband. Okay, and then you can bring in all the theory you want. Okay, so you do you 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 want to do simple so you want to do white and match filtering followed by bitter B decoding for optimal detection. Okay, but nobody is going to do that in practice because if once the number of taps becomes six or seven or eight, you can't do bitter B. Okay. So the best structure next is the MMS EDFE and that's always done and in practice you want to do also fractionally spaced equalization and adjust for the delta f inside your equalizer by doing career decision directed career recovery. Okay. So that's the way in which the whole thing works. Okay. okay, so let me just quickly summarize all those things that happened here. So instead of doing the optimal thing, so we pick the MMSE DFE with a, a fractionally spaced implementation. Okay, a fractionally spaced MMSE DFE. That's what we are doing. So it's got two filters. The first filter is a precursor, but the precursor does what? Both match filtering and the 
equalization precursor and then the post cursor which works at symbol rate okay this is twice symbol rate this is this works at symbol rate okay and you want to do that all right and the next next crucial role is placed is played by the slicer error okay it's going to give you all the loops that you want the first loop it gives you is equalizer <coughs> adapting loop okay you have to set up a proper lms or some such algorithm carefully and in the fractionally spaced equalizer case every second uh, output only can be adapted for the precursor post cursor you adapt adapt adapted single signal rate another loop it drives is the carrier recovery loop remember this is a symbol rate carrier recovery loop okay so you're only doing you're just finding different complex numbers different rotations different values on the unit circle to rotate by okay so that's what you're finding uh, that's that's the way i i drew it you could also have like uh, he was pointing out could also take a bandpass signal a version of the bandpass signal and feed it to your carrier recovery to help it okay it's possible I'll, I'll describe that briefly you'll see why it's possible see bpsk what are you doing for instance in bpsk modulation you're sending either cos 2 pi fct or minus cos 2 pi fct so if you square it what will happen you'll get cos a frequency a pure frequency at 2 fc right and then you divide by 2 dividing by 2 is quite okay so you do that you get fc okay that's one more way of doing carrier recovery there's very various ways of doing carrier recovery so if you do that then there'll be other components here you can do it in various ways okay this carrier recovery loop and then you have a timing recovery loop okay so it produces three different timing pulses okay one at symbol rate one at twice symbol rate and one which which if necessary if you're doing nyquist rate but also that will also be some multiple of this okay so you never want to produce clocks which are not multiples of each other right so usually you never do that in uh, boards okay so this is what this is what it drives okay so so those are the various components of a uh, of a receiver and uh, for all you see receiver boards they might be floating around you might be able to get it i think a couple of places where i suggest if you're interested one is the telematics lab downstairs where they have a satellite receiver board okay so you can go there and you can see all these components and figure out what chips they are using what is the what is the coolest pll chip out there for doing timing recovery extra 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 these things keep changing because all these chip makers keep changing the chips once in a while so what chips to use and all you can see and also another place is uh, iwl intel wireless lab where i think i think there is some there are some wireless receiver boards you might be able to see some extra components okay so you can see that if you want all right so what we're going to do next I, i know i had a big list for you but what we're going to do, do next is a bit of slowing down okay so the first thing i want to do is i want to look, go back and look at simple bpsk and draw uh basically signal diagrams okay so what, what does the signal look like at different points for simple bpsk okay so i think people who do the lab already know this because they've actually seen the signals but anyway i think everybody should see them because you should know how the signal actually looks right i never did that carefully enough before so we should just i think i'm going to do that for bpsk and maybe for qpsk and then with with different types of pulse shapes initially with rectangular pulse shape and then with raised cosine pulse shape so just to get to see what the signals look like then you can play around with it okay so this is mostly review just to make sure you don't forget the very basics which are very important okay so the first thing i'm going to review is bpsk with rectangular pulse shape and ideal channel this is the easiest okay so once again how does this look like you have a symbol sequence which is plus ones and minus ones okay and you have a rectangular pulse shape which is one between 0 and t t is the symbol rate and you get a signal out which you're going to up convert by multiplying by 
e power j 2 pi f c t and then what should you do should take the real part okay and that gives you the x 2 t the reason why i'm drawing it like this is if you want to do q p s k what will you do you will have one more line which takes the imaginary part okay so well think about it okay so that's roughly something like that you would do okay you have x2 of t then this goes through a channel which i'm saying is ideal okay this is an ideal channel so it's basically delta of t okay so don't worry about the channel too much you get a received vector to which i'm going to add noise at the receiver of course anything you do will add noise and then you get the actual received vector which you have to deal with yes it's okay yeah it's true <laughs> the real part and imaginary part will come before i know at the receiver you would do something else x1 of t is going to be the signal here okay so what i want you to do is i'm going to say s of k is something like this it's at zero it is plus one at t it is minus one at two t it is minus one and three t it is plus one okay so i want you to draw what x1 of t will be what x2 of t will be what r1 of t will be and what r2 of t will be roughly okay this is a transmitter Okay, x1 of t is the easiest. It's going to be 1 between 0 and t minus 1 from t and 3t. Am I right? Then 1 again from 3t to 4t. Okay, that's x1 of t. What do you do for x2 of t? So it's basically x1 of t multiplied by what? cos 2 pi f c t. So, you need some information about the relationship between f c and t. So, I am going to say, let us say for a simple case, four, 4 cycles of the carrier will show up in each symbol. Okay. So, suppose you assume that plot the plot x 2 of t. So, you can take that 4 to be any other number also of course, you can take 3 if you like. But in practice, it will be much larger. No, You expect it to be very, very large. x2 of t okay so i'm taking cos 2 pi fc and i said four cycles maybe three cycles we'll see one two okay so i'm able to fit in only three cycles very nicely so i'll take three cycles okay so that's how the first thing will look what will happen next there will be a discontinuity, right? There will be a sharp discontinuity here. It will go down to minus 1. There will be a 180 degree phase shift. Okay, so once again, 1, 2, 3. But there will be no phase discontinuity at 2t because the same symbol is going through. 1, 2, 3. Okay, I am drawing it with uh, different frequencies. There is no frequency modulation going on here. Okay, so it is the same frequency. Nothing changes. Okay, then once again there will be a abrupt phase shift of 180 here. Okay, one, two, three, and then it will come down to zero and stop. 
this is what you expect x2 of t to be okay suppose i give you only x2 of t how do you identify the symbols okay just by looking at it yeah so you have to look at places where phase change happened okay so you also know given you know t you know exactly where to look suppose you don't know capital t suppose you don't know zero okay suppose you don't know zero when will you not know zero you don't know right at the receiver you're receiving whole bunch of things you don't know where zero is okay and you won't even know capital d suppose you don't know both of those can you still identify where what the bits are and where they occurred roughly okay suppose roughly if you have to do how will you find t for instance okay so assuming there are enough transitions in your data which will happen if your data is random you can look for points of where there is 180 degree phase shift and then roughly see what the time difference is between 180 degree phase shifts and then do what look at the gcd or something rough gcd of those numbers to get your capital t a rough estimate of capital t so then based on that you can figure out whether or not a phase change happened and and did not happen the only thing you can't figure out is the first phase you won't know whether it was plus or minus right i conveniently pick the zero phase here but you don't know what phase it started in right you can never know that so only thing you can't fix is the initial bit after that everything else you can fix okay so this this is very important in practice when you're debugging your receiver right you should know if your input signal is okay or not okay you should check if the 180 degree transitions happen okay if it is qpsk what will happen let me see who gives me the answer qpsk what will be this these signals shifted by 90 degrees yeah the phase change will be multiples of 90 degrees it could be zero it could be 90 degrees it could be 180 degrees it could be 270 degrees so but still there will be phase changes so you just look for places where the phase is changing and doing that okay but all those things are obviously not optimal receiver practices right that's just for debugging your receiver circuit what's the optimal receiver circuit first thing you do is a band pass filtering followed by phase phase splitting followed by a preliminary demodulator and then a match filter those that's the way that's the way you do actual reception okay so you can just look at it and kind of eyeball the base base band band pass signal and figure out if it's okay or not that's okay to do but don't use that as your receiver principle okay so it's just an approximate thing way of doing things okay so let me show you how the receiver would look and then try to plot uh, well the other things i have not plotted are r1 of t what will r1 of t look like if i say channel is ideal it will roughly look similar okay so in most cases if you are using very little bandwidth like we are doing here right for this for this assumption we'll use very little bandwidth right channel will be roughly flat most most channels will be flat and you will not see any much, much distortion here and if your noise is small enough r2 of t will also look roughly like this so this is a good way of debugging if your transmitter is working correctly or not just look at this signal how will you capture such a signal in a scope can you capture it is it possible what will happen what do you expect okay so think about it might be possible okay anyway so that's those are questions to uh, worry about so let's see so you have r2 of t coming into your receiver you do a band pass filter that's fine followed by well uh, you have to do a phase splitter also right so band pass filter and a phase splitter okay so i'll write ps here okay phase splitter and then you do a preliminary demodulation e power minus j so i want to be a little bit accurate here so i'll write f1t uh, 2 pi f1t plus theta minus theta okay so minus theta is just for convenience plus or minus theta some theta okay okay the reason why i'm writing that is i don't know if my op mod uh, the frequency of demodulation is equal to fc and uh, and you can never be sure about the phase right it's very tough to lock all these things very correctly so initially when i do it there might be a phase problem also you might be able to lock it either here or later on in the circuit that's okay but you may not be able to lock exactly okay so then you do what here you have to take real part again okay so here you might take the imaginary part and feed it to your 
Q channel kind of thing. Is that okay? Or maybe some some such thing you'll have to do to get the Q channel. Okay, so maybe maybe you demodulate differently for the Q channel as well. Okay, so you take real part. At least in BPSK you simply take real part, right? There's no problem. Simply take real part. You get your you get your uh, signal. Okay. So 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 I'm going to call this guy as R3 of T. Okay. After this, what do I do? I have to do match filtering. Right now I have the complex baseband signal. I have to do match filtering. Okay, so in this case the match filtering is what? Rectangular pulse. What is match filtering? Same. <laughs> okay, so you have to basically integrate and dump. Right, so that's what you have to do. That's what you do. So you do integration from zero to t, and then you do a sampling. Okay, so once again, there's a KT plus tau because there will be some delay because of all these things. You won't, you will never know where it is. So that's your filter. Like I said, R2 of t is roughly the same as X2 of t. There will be some noise. So I want you to try and plot R3 of t. Okay, so that's where the trick comes. Assume F1 is close to FC but not necessarily equal to FC, and theta is not necessarily zero. It could be something else. And try to compute what R3 of t will be, and then try to plot it. Okay, so first try to write an expression for R3 of t in terms of say x1 of t. Okay, try to compute an expression for R3 of t in terms of x1 of t, which is your transmitted complex baseband signal. Well, it's actually real baseband signal, but complex baseband signal. Try to compute R3 of t like that. Okay. Everything going well, R3 of t should agree with x1 of t. Do you see that? Right? It should agree exactly with x1 of t. That's your that's your complex baseband signal. You have recovered your complex baseband signal now. Before the up converter, go back and see that. Before the up converter, you had x1 of t. So x1 of t should have come back as exactly R3 of t, ideally. Okay. But assuming a delta f and a theta, try to derive an expression for R3 of t in terms of x1 of t, roughly. Okay. And then, of course, there'll be a plus noise. We don't care about the noise; just the signal component of it. What does it work out? Zoom channel is ideal. Okay, so we're quickly running out of time. So, what does it work out to? X1 of t times cos 2 pi 2 pi delta f t plus theta plus some noise. Okay, so I'll call it simply n prime of t. I don't care about it. Okay, that's some noise. Okay, so this is your signal. You expected x1 of t. You're getting cos 2 pi delta f t plus theta. Okay, if delta f is zero, theta is zero, or you know theta roughly. So it's it's exactly x1 of t. There's no problem. But if you don't know theta and if you don't know delta f, it can be a, a different signal. Okay. So one way to just try and get a feel for it is to try and plot x1 of t or r3 of t, assuming a different delta f, a delta f not equal to zero. Okay. So nominally, you expect x1 of t to be like something like this. 
right roughly you expect this for x1 of t okay what will happen when you multiply by cos 2 pi of ct delta f delta f t plus theta okay so it depends on what delta f is suppose i say delta f is really small okay it's going to be very small so in fact even this is a very small frequency right the symbol rate is very very small so it might actually show up significantly in this even if delta f is small okay so you might get something like a cosine picture which is like this but what will happen there there will be a 180 degree phase shift so you it won't continue like this it will continue in this way okay it will go off like this and then maybe come down here and then once again there will be a 180 degree phase shift depending on am i right am i making a mistake it will again go up positive no or no no it will be minus right it will come here and then do what oops what happened what is this <laughs> okay anyway i am not able to figure out how to erase it okay so it should it should what it should go up or come down come down right go up you sure it will go up okay so because it's coming this way so this should should go up again and then maybe i don't know where it will go maybe it doesn't go all the way up okay so it looks it look roughly like this so so it look a bit too crazy okay so it's nothing to do with what you expected before okay so of course if delta f is 0 theta is 0 then you would have got the nice flat thing so the next stage in checking your receiver is to see what after your after the complex baseband signal is does it seem to be what you expected okay if you if you expect a delta f then such crazy shapes will show up okay so it's difficult to make sense of them otherwise if you've never seen it before you look at it and say looks like something else is happening this is dipping that is dipping you might come up with all kinds of philosophies but ultimately delta f can cause things like because delta f is really really small also right so it will show up in a strange way it's tough to understand okay so hopefully you also see theta is important even if delta f is zero if theta is close to say pi by 2 then everything is gone so you're not you're not the phase of your carrier is also crucially important okay so that's why these detectors are called coherent detectors you have to know the frequency as well as the phase it should be matched properly okay so it's a, it's, it's not phase is not that serious a problem okay the reason is equalizers can handle the phase okay that's why phase is not a serious problem but you still it's good to have a matched uh, phase okay all right so we'll stop here Yes. If you look at the imaginary part, okay. Yes. Due to the theta, something else will come from there. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Those things we'll see. Next thing will be QPS.